This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Check out with Greg Murphy. Murphy, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to Glove Stories with Murph, presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. And this week, we have a professional storyteller with us, a guy that spent more than 40 years inside the Phillies organization. And he is a guy that, uh, well, he's seen it all over the course of those four plus decades. He's also a very good friend. We welcome in Chris Wheeler to the show. Chris, first of all, Wheels, thanks so much for being here uh, from your perch down there in Florida, the beautiful view that you have. But uh, it's just great to see you again. You too, Murph. And uh, I totally agree with the the good friend part. You and I have known each other, seems like forever. Yeah. From way back in your old CNA days when you were (laughs) working those beats and everything. And you were always such a pro and fun to be around. And that was great when we got to work together. Yeah, it certainly was. And uh, it's some of the mem- memories I cherish the most uh, being uh, part of the Phillies organization, being around you guys, you and Sarge and, and all of them. But <laughs> let's go back to your beginnings, because I always say people ask all the time, how did you get into your line of work? And I always say, well, <laughs> I stepped in it, to be quite honest. I, I'm lucky. We're all very lucky to have a career uh, in baseball, in sports and broadcasting. And, you know, you are no different. You came out of Penn State uh, wide-eyed, looking for a job. You end up with the Phillies organization with a thought of being on the air. Was that something in your mind at some point? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, figuring it was unlikely. Uh, I had I was a broadcast journalism major at Penn State, so I had some experience in the industry. But I had never really, uh, you know, I'd worked for CBS and some stations and all that. But I basically was the assistant director of publicity and public relations under Larry Shank which meant that I took a lot of abuse from Whitey because uh, he, he never, he didn't really care if something was accurate or not, but whenever something was wrong, he would blame me. And it became kind of a part of the shtick to work with Harry and Whitey and Andy with that sort of stuff going on. So that part of it, I always wanted to be around the broadcasters. I have to admit, I was more interested in being around them than the sports writers in those days. Right. Yeah. And, and you got that opportunity, you know, cause the story about how, how it happened is it's almost kind of what legends are made of, to be quite honest. I mean, you know, th- there's luck and then there's, there's like just dumb luck and, and, and that's Whitey and Whitey was right there for you. Dumb luck, all of, all of that Murph in, uh, in 1976, as a lot of fans remember, we played Montreal doubleheader. Um, if we win the first game of the doubleheader, we go to the playoffs for the first time in postseason since 1950. Well, have a great game in the first game. Phillies win that first game and uh, they go downstairs and uh, I'm down there with them and everybody's, you see the demo, you know, you've been involved in the champagne and everything, but unlike, I don't know that ever happened before or since you had to play another game. Yeah. So, (laughs) so now we get all cleaned up and go back upstairs and uh, Harry and Whitey are in there doing the game. And I used to pop in all the time because why do you say here comes that Chris Wheeler guy that screws up the notes and makes us sound bad all the time, but he's always wanted to do this. So why don't you just sit down and do this today? And he's got up. He didn't want to do the game. He got up and he took his headset. I'll never forget this. And he said, sit down. I sit down. I'm sitting there with Harry and I am having a ball Murph. It, uh, it was one of those days where, you know, I kind of what I did later on, you know, I'd say a guy was going to run, he'd run, you know, pitch, right. you know, all that. So I was kind of hot that day. So ne- unbeknownst to me, our audience being pumped into the booth next door and John McHale is the general manager of the Expos is sitting there with Bill Giles. Bill and John tell the story to me later. They said, John turns to Bill and he says, Bill, who's that broadcaster of yours? And he says, John, I'm sorry. I don't know what the hell he's doing in there. He's a <laughs> PR guy. And, and John says, no, let me interrupt you. He's really good. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that. So Bill had the idea the following year, Bysom had left the, the booth and Andy Musser was working alone on radio. He said, you know what? We need a guy to be on radio when the games are televised in 1977. He said, I don't have to pay this guy any more money. He goes on every road trip. I mean, I'm getting a freebie out of it. And the worst he can do is screw it up and I'll get somebody else. That's how I got it. And I look back, Murph, and if we'd have lost the first game of the doubleheader, 
may have never happened may never have happened you know it is that uh it's that tenuous when when, when you're in this business you just yeah. never know but the beauty of it is that not only did you make the most of that opportunity but the Phillies organization is just it's a place where those kinds of things can happen that that, that doesn't happen in other places but you know with Bill Giles you mentioned Bill uh you know in charge you know he was he was a guy that took chances all over the place and why not take a chance on a young guy like yourself that's what he said to me later on when things worked out he said uh you know he was happy that he had done that and and they used he said you ought to call John McHale every every day and thank him <laughs> and I when I would run into John McHale yeah, was one of the great men in the game that I've been so lucky to meet so many of them Murph and he's gone of course now but uh, when I would run into John, either in Montreal, or he would come to Philadelphia. He's a big, tall guy, about six, five. He walked over and slapped me on the shoulder. And he says, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a great relationship after that. And I, you know, I thank Bill to this day that, uh, yeah. he gave me that opportunity and, you know, I guess I did. Okay. Yeah, I think you did. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Bill Giles because he is, uh, you know, when you think about the Philadelphia Phillies over the last 50 years you cannot think about them without starting with bill giles and and the influence uh that he has had over the every part of this organization and the people that he's touched along the way and brought to town and and all of that uh but he's he's a character and has always been a character and i know that you've uh spent a lot of time with bill probably <laughs> out on that golf course that, that you're sitting next to yeah um but uh you know was there a better person to to kind of go through this this uh this uh path on on the baseball side of things than with bill giles combination of him and dave montgomery were yeah. just an unbelievable situation you know as you got to know both of them so well but bill bill uh bill liked to make people happy bill liked to make fans come to the ballpark and have a good time you know if, if the game was lousy he wanted them to go home and say man i had a great time there today so as a result, he did a lot of crazy things with all the opening day acts. And, you know, Larry, Sh there were only about 10 of us in a staff meeting back in those days. You know, the, it's so big now. Yeah. So we would sit there and Larry and I, he used to call us, you know, that we were so negative that we would always, but we didn't want to see the great Wallenda take a splat in the middle of a double header and have to clean him up and then try to play the second game. So, you know, we would say things, are you going to shoot this guy out of a cannon? Are you serious? Are you going <laughs> to? You're going to have a guy come in the ballpark on skis and call him the great kite man and all this stuff. We kept thinking sooner or later, <laughs> it was going to backfire. Never did. We got away with all of it. Fans loved it. Fans got used to Bill having all these great opening day acts and stuff yeah. during the year. And that was his philosophy, Murph. He wanted people to come to the ballpark and have a great family experience. And I think they really did and still do. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. And obviously the Philly fanatic, uh, he has his fingerprints all <laughs> over that. And and uh, he's still such a big part of the franchise. It, it's remarkable to think when, when you think back to those uh, events that uh, that that he was planning, um, you know, you guys, like you said, it was a small staff back then. So, you know, not only are you doing PR and on the air doing broadcasting, but you're probably helping out in nine other different facets. Were you ever involved in any of those uh, pregame shows that you ever have to, you know, give the guy a push down the uh, the ramp or anything like that? Well, early on, early on, yeah, you're right. We and I never, I, I I worked in the scoreboard for the most part before my years as a broadcaster. So I was in there with a great guy named Dennis Lehman, who you've probably heard so much yeah. about, and then Dan Baker, who started in '72. We we were in there doing that kind of stuff. So we would just sit in there and watch these things and just sit there and cringe as they would happen. He never made us go push <laughs> push somebody <laughs> down a ramp or help set up the great, uh, that guy, Benny the Bomb, who blew himself up. That was just, geez. I can still hear that noise when that thing exploded all over the place. And yeah. All the crazy, hey, with the highest jumping Easter Bunny that he, that he, you know, Paul Callahan was, well, he was in the Easter Bunny suit and they, in one of those hot air balloons. Well, what they failed to uh, check on those days was the air currents that came in the sides of the vet, you know. So the uh, highest jumping Easter bunny would start up to jump out of the vet and then he'd come down again. And it, I would say about the fourth time, even though it was an Easter Sunday crown, they really started to boo. Yeah. So the Easter bunny got booed in Philadelphia and then make things worse. All these kids were around there and uh, 
Callahan finally jumped out of there to get away. And you know that hot that, you know, you see the flame and everything. Well, it started burning his tail as he was running away. So all those kids were traumatized by the Easter bunny with a flaming tail running away. <laughs> and they're still in therapy cool. to this day, right? Yeah, <laughs> they're still talking about it. But you know what? That's what it was all about. But as the 70s were going on, the baseball was actually getting better in Philadelphia too, to the point that in 76 and 77, I mean, the, the Phillies were the one of the teams to beat in the National League. And I know you're, well, you're obviously very close with a lot of those guys uh, to this day, but even back then, uh, you know, being similar age of the guys that were on the team, the Boas and the Lezinskis, you had a pretty strong relationship with those guys, um, you know, on and off the field, right? Yeah, I saw them all come up. They said, Bo was there when I got there. He was really of the, of the core, the nucleus of the thing. Bo was the one guy was there. He was there in 70, and I started in 71. And then I saw the rest of them come through the minor leagues, like like Schmidt and, and Bob Boone uh, and, and some of the great players that we produced out of the farm system. Um, and then made, got in trades like Maddox and Carlton and those kind of guys. But it was fun to watch them develop, see Greg Luzinski come up and become this unbelievable power hitter. So, yeah, we developed a really close bond. And you could see by about the mid-70s when Dave Cash came over with the Yes, We Can uh, and Tug came into, over to the ball club and some of the things that Paul Owens was and Dallas Green were just great player personnel people. Right. They did a tremendous job. And Ruley Carpenter just let them go. But you could see they were starting to get good. Hey, we were getting on the – it was a big deal back then, Murph. We got on the game of the week once in a while. We would be on national yeah. television. How cool was that? The All-Star game, you know, we had starters in the All-Star game and had five or six players representing us that year in 76. So you could kind of see it coming – that they were going to get good and um, 75 kind of showed it. And then by 76, well, they were a really good team that won a lot of games that year, went to the playoffs and they won 101 games the next two years. Unfortunately, all three years got knocked out of postseason. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's it, we've talked to Larry Ball about that on this uh, podcast a, a couple of times. And, you know, it's funny because you, if you fast forward to 1980, but uh, and, and we will do that in a sec. But I want to ask you, though, do you what do you remember about uh, because the excitement around that team and the excitement around possibly going to a World Series in Philadelphia was palpable in the city, but then it ended in disappointment again and again. What do you remember about that? Just you personally, how disappointing was it for you? Well, the first time in 70s, you know, back in those days, you know, it's so long ago, people forget. All you had to do was win three games. Yep. You don't know all these layers of playoffs. You won three games. You won the National League. You played the American League champion. You went to the World Series. That was it. So the first year in 76, we, we got beaten three games in a row by the big red machine. And that was Pete, one of Pete's great teams and all those great players. But the next two years, those losses to the Dodgers were really hard. The rain game, uh, the drop fly ball uh, in the outfield, all the kind of things that, that, that went wrong in those games. And they knew they were really good, but they couldn't get over the hump. And then they were really starting to age a little bit as time went on. And in 79, we had three starting pitchers go down or right around July 4th, all at the same time. Pirates had the, uh, the great team, We Are Family, that year. By 80, I think they all knew, and Bo would be the best one to talk about this, but I think they knew that uh, they better win in 1980 yeah. or they were going to start breaking them up. And that's when, you know, Dallas had come on in 79 to replace Danny Ozark at that time. And, you know, they weren't real crazy about Dallas being the manager, but uh, uh, it all worked out because they played for him. Yeah, it, it did all work out. And, and you're right. Larry has talked about how they knew they knew that if they didn't win in 80, that team was going to get broken up. And they were and it was it was time at that point if they hadn't been able to to go on and win in 80. Uh, you mentioned Dallas Green. Um, what a baseball man, you know, a baseball lifer. And and to your point, a perfect guy for that team. They didn't all like each other. There was times when they didn't like each other at all. Uh, I remember an interview with bull uh, talking about how, you know, they just kind of banged heads all the time, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, it, it worked for him. Tell me a little bit about the uh, Dallas green and your relationship with him. Well, it was scary at first, yeah. you know, I'm, just, I'm I, there was nothing scarier than when Paul Owens and Dallas green got on you. It's so different now. Everybody thinks, you know, they, it's just, if you're afraid to yell at anybody right now, they'll put their head down, step on, you know, yep. step on their, on their tongue. You know, they're just, you know, they, 
it, it's just kind of soft nowadays. And whether that's good or bad, that's not for me to say. But back when I started in the 70s, you just kept your mouth shut and kept your head down and did your job. And if one of them jumped you about something, it was frightening because they're both big. Yep. They were both loud. Dallas was so loud. <laughs> and uh, they could get their, they got their point across. But you know what? They, they, took, they taught people like me and my generation how to act how to be a professional, how to carry yourself in the business. And I, I took great pride in that my whole life uh, of being in the business and, and trying to do things, quote unquote, the right way. And that's the way Bo was and, and a great guy, John Vukovic, who we talk so much about. So, yeah, they, they knew, though, that he had the hammer over them because Ruley Carpenter had turned it over to Dallas Green. They had come through the farm system together, Ruley had, after his, his you know, when he was there with his dad, Bob owned the ball club and then left and really took over. So they knew that they couldn't get rid of Ruley. I mean, I couldn't get rid of, get rid of Dallas Green. They right. might've been able to get rid of Danny and somebody else they didn't like. Dallas wasn't going anywhere. So it was whether they wanted to hump up and play or whether they wanted to quit and go somewhere else. And to all their credit, they decided in 1980, they all got together and they said, all right, you know, whether we like this guy or not, basically we're going to win. And they won for themselves and for the city of Philadelphia. They didn't win for Dallas. Trust me. <laughs> no, they won with Dallas, but maybe not for right. Dallas. Right. Uh, that changed Murph. As you said, that changed as the years went on. Like we sure all, did. we all get a lot smarter as we get older and realize that people that maybe we didn't like were really just trying to help us. And Dallas became very, very close with those guys that he had a lot of trouble with that year. Yeah, they certainly did. Uh, I've seen that with my own two eyes. Talk a little bit about the influences uh, that helped you become the broadcaster that you became because, you know, you were in a in a in interesting role, a guy that never played, but yet you knew the game. And I tell people this all the time. You knew the game as well as anybody knew the game of baseball. And I know, you know, partly that was the hard work that you put in, but partly was the influences of some of the guys that you've already mentioned you know, talking baseball with you and you soaking in like a sponge, right? Who would you say are your biggest influence? Those guys accepted me. Uh, as I said, a lot of us were around the same age. And back in those days, you'd go out at night and you'd talk. Yeah. Um, it's, it's I, you know, it's harder when I go biggest influences because I may forget somebody. But, you know, there's so many of them like I keep mentioning Larry Ball. He and I to this day are very close and yep. still love to talk the game. Bull was very important to me. John Vukovic, uh, as time went on, Tim McCarver um, and the guys I work with in the booth. Uh, no doubt about it. Uh, to be able to, to be a four man booth with Harry, Richie, Andy and me for so long, I. I it's like some people didn't even know I did it, but I didn't even care because I was just so honored to be with those guys and to learn the, the profession from them. And um, they all kind of describe me as a sponge. Uh, I listened a lot. I ask a lot. Of, I always tell kids, hey, don't be afraid to ask questions because you're not going to learn it. I ask a lot of questions. And I was lucky, Murph, and I appreciate what you said. I kind of had a feel for the game. I had played it at every level <laughs> that you can play amateur before, you know, the that I just got out talented and sure. I couldn't play anymore after I was about 16 or 17, but I knew what it was like down there and I knew how hard it was. And then I learned the intricacies of the game. And I think when Tim McCarver and I started working together in the early eighties, that was a baseball mind that few are lucky enough to be around the way I was. And he taught me so much about the game. Yeah, it, it really is remarkable. I, you know, I, I was lucky enough to learn a ton from you and from the guys that, uh, that I've been blessed to be in the booth with as well. Uh, and that's how it is. That's you pass on that knowledge to the next generation and, and, uh, and, and it keeps on going. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing, quite frankly, it's, it's, it's the way we do our business. It's the way we work. And, uh, and well, I think there's, I don't mean it. it I think <laughs> there's so much of nowadays that goes on that everybody wants to have a shtick or see how outrageous they can be or, how many, uh, what do you call them, clicks and all that nonsense you get. And uh, back in those days, you, you knew your place. Yeah. And you just tried to learn and get better. And, um, you know, I, I always didn't want to be a dinosaur. And you know I wasn't. I mean, I, I adapted to the, the way the game changed over the years. I have a little tougher time right now, I got to admit. I, I sit there some nights and say, oh, my God, I'm glad I'm not on because I would really be getting in trouble right now. But um, I had such a great run at a time, and I really did 
look, I looked at it as I'm so lucky that I'm sitting here with these people and I have a- access to Pete Rose to sit on the bus to him, right. on the bus with him after a game. And he asked me, what you think about what happened in the fifth inning? And I think you asked me, what, what do you think happened in the fifth inning? Yeah. So I was able to do those kind of things. And I learned a lot. Yeah. You mentioned Vuk a couple of times, and uh, I know he is a, a very special person in your life. Um, and he was, um, for lack of a better <laughs> word, he was he was a buster. I won't, I won't <laughs> elaborate, but he, uh, you know, he brought it to everybody that he that he cared about, you know, it, it, and he did it uh, because he wanted to he wanted you to know that he cared about you first and foremost, but he also wanted you to you know, continue to get better. And he did that with all with players and teammates and, and he did it with you guys as well. What's your, what's your fondest memory of, of Vuk? And it might be him giving you a hard time because he did it all the time. Oh, that's so much of that. For a guy who hit 168, he, he influenced a lot of people in our game. Yeah. And you know, Murph, with him, you had to earn it. Yes. You definitely, I, one, of, one of my favorite stories was we had a great writer named Mark Wicker who went on to, you know, national prominence and they went down in Dallas and he came up to Vuk one day and he said, Hey, Vuk, you, you kind of proud of these uh, convenience stores around here that are named after you? And uh, Vuk, all right, Wick, where are you going with it? He says, Well, you know, everywhere you turn, you look down here, you see something named the Circle K. <laughs> well, that was your career. <laughs> Okay, and then you circled it in the box. I'll never forget that. And Boo, Boo could take that from the people that he liked, but as you know, and I'm sure he did it to you. And I thought he was, I get mad at him sometimes. I would say, You're nasty to people. He said, Well, you're too nice to people. And so we kind of kind of had that middle ground that we went with, but he would test you. And uh, I'll never forget, and Leslie Goodell will tell the story better than me, but he, you know, he didn't want women around. He didn't care. What are women doing it? So he tested her and he, he, you know, you know, he used the, yeah, go back to the kitchen and all that. So one day with Frank Kopenberger, Leslie set up during batting practice in the coach's room, right at his table, a beautiful meal. She had the tablecloth. She had a roast beef dinner. His favorite is chocolate cake. I think everything that he liked, because I told her what he liked. So she, he comes in afterwards and he comes in and he looks at that table she pops in at the same time and you know i used to kid that he didn't have any teeth because you wouldn't see him smile well he had a great smile he, he, he had that big smile and he went okay you made your point and from that day <laughs> on those two were best of friends and he really respected her in the business and those are kind of things it took a little while i mean not everybody made him dinner like that but right. it took a little while to get his respect sometimes but when you got it uh you, you were there with him. He used to say Philadelphia is the toughest town in the, to play in because the fans test you. They try to crack you and they try to say if you'll quit on them and you want to get out. He says, and if you don't, they'll love you for life. And Pat Burrow may have been the biggest uh, example of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And uh, you know what? That was it also describes Vuk a little bit. You know, he was a, he, he had that mentality, but uh, you couldn't help but love him and respect him when you were around him because uh, you, like I said, you knew if he was if he was doing that to you, it was because he he was giving you a chance. And yep. uh, you know, you, you got that respect from him and and you never lost it at that point. And, he he and I used to sit on the plane a lot, which was great. We spent so much time on airplanes together and he was miserable after games and everything, but Every once in a while, he'd be in a good mood when he sat down. He'd say, all right, right now, I'm going to continue your baseball education. (laughs) And he would ask about a situation in the game. And he, you know, he's proud if I would think, but no. And then he would add to it and I would learn something from it. So other times I would sit there, I'd look out the window and he'd sit down and say, don't say a word. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, what makes you think I want to talk to you right now anyway? And after he had his dinner and his chocolate cake and a nap with his mouth open for about a half an hour, then he was okay. Yeah, I can totally see that. Uh, you know, talk to me a little bit about uh, the, the 1993 team, because that was a special <laughs> group of guys. Again, guys that uh, you're still close to with this day to this day. But, um, you know, I would imagine being around them the way that you guys were, the broadcasters were, um, that had to be a lot of fun. It had to be, uh, <laughs> sometimes you probably were like, what is going on here? But, uh, I, you know, they're fun loving for sure. And I would imagine it was pretty fun to be around. You know, it, They were a different bunch because some of them are even, or more fun loving now than they were back then. That's some true. We're all business. They, yeah. uh, they, you know, they didn't let you in necessarily. 
um, like the way I got let in with the 80 club because we were all young together. You know, they kind of kept you at arm's length, some of them. Others like a Larry Anderson was Larry Anderson. You know, he was just great. Darren was unbelievable. Dutch was just, to this day, one of those people that you just, yeah. you just say you're lucky to know him. <laughs> I still wish I could, you know, have him to come up right now and give you one of those hugs. You used to see him coming and you'd think, oh, no, he's going to give you a hug. He's going to give you a kiss and, you know, with that beard and... and, and, and <laughs> But he, he was so genuine and he meant it. And Jim Fergosi did an unbelievable job with that team of getting the best out of them. Um, they were fun. Some of them were fun to be around. As I said, some of them were a lot more fun to be around now than they were back then. Yep. But one thing about them was they were all business. Um, and they loved that old beer, beer be bellies and whatever they used to call them, beards and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They loved going into a town and intimidating the other team. And they loved coming, the teams coming in here to Philadelphia and having our fans intimidate those fans. Yeah. So for one year, I mean, it was, it was a one it was year. Fleeting. Thing. Yeah. It, yeah. It was magic for one year and it all went away pretty quickly, but they were really, really good. And to this day, I'm surprised they didn't beat the Blue Jays in the world series. Yeah, you know, it would it would have been the storybook ending, obviously. And it was still, you know, I was uh, graduating college that year and just getting into the business. And I was lucky enough to cover the 93 team as a as a pup reporter. And I was scared to death going into that clubhouse. <laughs> some of those guys, some of those guys who I considered very close friends now. Right. But back then, oh, man, uh, the third baseman, he scared me a little bit. Oh. <laughs> and he's the most lo lovable guy. Dave Holland's the most lovable guy around. But, man, oh, man, it was an intimidating place to be. Well, it depended if Mikey showed up that yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. if, my, if Mikey was sitting in that locker and not Dave, oh, yeah. you knew Mikey was there. I, I'll never forget, we played an exhibition game down here. It was the last day of spring training. We played the Boston Red Sox. We got no hit. Who cares? He couldn't wait to get on the bus. And, right. you know, it was time to go. And Well, Harry loved the players. So he just, every player was the greatest player in the world and, and the greatest person. And no matter what they were like, he loved everybody. So, right. He loved Dave Hollins and, and the players loved Harry. Yeah. And, you know, Dave the Hollins nickname was head. As I said to him one time, why, why do they call you head? He says, wheels, take a look at this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's a good it's, point. So that's... Harry goes over to him and he said, and he slaps him on the back and Headley, All right. It's time to go North. You know, we, it's time to get going, get the real games going. And Hollins gave him <laughs> Harry. <laughs> we just got no hit. Not now. I don't want to hear this. And it really, Harry told us this story, it really startled him. You know, he, yeah. he had to back off because he knew he wasn't kidding. So Dave back in those days, yeah, he, he yeah. was all business. He, he really he took everything to heart and he was a great competitor. Yeah, he certainly was. By the way, that was a pretty good Dave Holland's impersonation. <laughs> you sounded like him. <laughs> oh, I got it a few times. Once, you know, I'd be sitting around. I think, you know, next thing he come up to me and ask me why I said this or said that, or right. why do you keep all those books that you keep? What do you what What do you have to keep all those numbers? You know, back in those days, we had kept our own stuff. Right. It's not like now where they hand you everything. Yeah. So he would question you on things, and now he. <laughs> To this day, when I see him, he says, you let me know if anybody gives you any problems and I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> he's, one, he's, he's one of the best now. He really great. is. He's such great a great guy. guy. We're going to get him on uh, Glove Stories coming up uh, soon, sooner rather than later. Uh, you mentioned Darren, uh, best leader that you ever saw in baseball. Yeah. Or was, was he? Yeah, because leader, you want to, people always say, what's a leader? Well, a leader is a guy, first of all, has to play every day, in my opinion. A pitcher can't be a leader, mm -hmm. especially um, well, relievers are too goofy. And, right. and starters only go out there every fourth or fifth day. So, yeah. And, and the thing about it, Murph, why I say that to you is because I knew him when he was this uh, kid coming out of Kansas, this shy, skinny kid in spring training with us who was very nice and polite and yes, sir, and no, sir, and all that. That was not his nature. His nature was not to be a tough guy. Right. But Jimmy asked him that year, Fergosi asked him that year to take care of some things for him. He did. He says, I don't want to go in there. I don't want my coaches going in there all the time. I want those guys to police themselves. And if they don't, you handle it for me. And I'll be darned if he didn't. He did a great job. But uh, to this day, I, I, 
I'm so many people have gotten to know Darren over the years, I'm sure. And they know how sweet and nice he was. That's the way he really was. He wasn't that tough guy that he was portrayed in 93, but Jim Leland wanted him for the Marlins that year and they won a world series with him. Same too. reason. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you need, you need that personality in there. Yeah. I, I agree with you. You know, you get him away from, from the ball, the ballpark and he's, he was a different person. Well, I, I've been victimized by those hugs uh, a couple of times. And he, there <laughs> it, was nothing, it was wonderful. There was nothing like walking into a bar with him yeah. and watching the heads turn. <laughs> yeah. We <laughs> just, yeah. just kind of hang back. Oh, the female heads would turn. Yes. Uh, well, sure. that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Was, exactly uh, right. It was, uh, it was, they didn't, maybe they didn't know who he was, but they knew he was somebody. <laughs> yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. We miss him for sure. Um, uh, every day. I miss him a lot. Yeah. yeah every day. Uh, tell me, you know, I can't let you go before we talk a little bit about the, your relationships. Uh, you know, I grew up listening to the four of you and, and I know that it, it dates us a little bit, but, but I really did. The four of you were in my bedroom each and every night. And, and I just, and I was lucky enough to, to meet all four of you at some point in my, in my life, uh, work with you. Um, you know, Harry was, was such a presence in the city of Philadelphia. I know he was a, a dear friend of yours. Um, what was it like just being around Harry, especially when he was around the fans, because, you know, he was beloved, obviously. Oh, yeah. And he was so good. You know, Harry was the most unbelievable broadcaster I was ever around for the moment. And you know exactly what I mean. You know, our game is, yes. you know, it kind of goes along and then something happens. He never missed. He told me one time when you when because I did a lot of more play by play back in those days. He told me one time, follow the ball, talk where the ball is because you're on radio right now. People don't know where the ball is. He was unbelievable in creating that moment and his excitement and the, his voice and all of it to rise at the right time. Uh, the ultimate, ultimate pro. And he loved baseball and he loved, he loved Philadelphia. He mm -hmm. just loved the fans and he liked being around the whole thing. Whitey, <laughs> Whitey was my boyhood idol. and I made the mistake of telling him that. And, uh, <laughs> he lived with me for a while and never paid me a cent of rent. Um, <laughs> about right and he, he said why should i i was your boyhood idol why would i give you any rent and he was dead serious about it andy musser very very um uh, i i think he was underrated i think so andy, I. he was a craftsman he wasn't harry and he wasn't whitey and nobody was right but uh he and i i worked together in the old days in 1965 and 66 i think it was at wcau radio when i was a kid uh, doing summer summer work there for uh, Jack Downey and the old WCAU team. So he and I were very, very good friends when he uh, started with the Phillies. Uh, so that uh, that was really easy to work work with him. And then for them to partner me up with him was uh, was one of my great thrills. Um, he's another guy, you know, I look back on, I'm the only one left and can't help but think of those guys. So many yeah. memories of all, all the great times we had and how lucky we were, Murph to do what we loved in a city like Philadelphia where uh, people are so passionate about it. Right. Oh, well, you know, they know more than you do and all that. That's fine. But it, I always admired the passion in this town. And it was something I tried to explain to players when they come up to me and says, you're from here, right? Yeah. Why are they so miserable? <laughs> and I said, no, no, you don't get it. Yeah. They just, they really love you and they really want you to do well but they react differently than in other towns. And uh, unfortunately they boo you. Well, they don't mean it personally because if you hit a home run on the next pitch, they'll cheer you. So exactly you have right. to try and win them over and accept it. And for the ones that did, uh, I don't think they'll ever have anything but great memories in Philadelphia. Yeah, agreed. And I tell people the same thing because I get asked the same question uh, sometimes. And and it's like, you know, if you understand where it's coming from, it makes it a lot easier to kind of, um, you know, find your way in Philadelphia as an athlete. And and it, it's true. I, I always say it's really kind of easy. Just go out there and play hard. Be honest when you're asked questions and uh, and do the best you can. You don't have to be the best player in Philadelphia to be beloved. We've seen that time and time again. Uh, you just have to go out there and, and show them that you care about it as much as they do. I think that's yeah. the bottom line. One of the players they had the toughest, toughest times with are, got, are good looking guys, yes. you know, the pretty boys. Yeah. They, they had to work harder. Yeah. Ask right. Cole Hamels. Yeah, exactly. Cole Hamels, Pat Burrell, you know, oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. So they really test them. 
Because, yeah. you know, because more of them look in the mirror and they see Kruk looking back at them. Right. So, you know, they, they, <laughs> let's be honest. So they, they, they <laughs> That, I, look, I look just like that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I could play professional ball. Yeah. yeah. Or or they sit on the one of the fun things we used to have when we did that fantasy camp down here. We called it Dream Week in those days. Well, you have those guys that'll be sitting on the couch at night and somebody swinging a ball in the dirt, Darren Dalton or somebody and saying, Oh, I could do that. Ah, you know, and that bum and all. And then the Dream Week ad would come on. And the next thing you know, his wife would buy it for him. The guy couldn't walk and chew gum when he got down here. <laughs> yeah. You know, thinking the baseball was easy. <laughs> Gives you an appreciation for the game, for sure. Yeah. No doubt about it. Uh, hey, before I let you go, uh, biggest character that, that you – who would you say, you know, you've been in baseball for a long time. It, it's full of characters. Well, who, who, is, who steps – you know, who sticks out as the, as the biggest for you? I'll tell you, one of the funniest guys and the biggest characters I was ever around was Roger McDowell. Okay, yeah. Now, he wasn't here that long. And, uh, you know, he came over with Lenny and that Mets deal. Um, somebody sent me the other day when he gave Vuk the hot foot. Have you ever seen that? He, he, oh, yeah, I've seen that, sure. He had a great – Roger had this great ability to time a fuse. He would put bubble gum and a match on the back, and somehow – it would take a while for it to ignite. So he got, he would get Book and he'd do it to him and Book could be out there coaching first base and boom, his shoe would catch on fire all of a sudden. <laughs> but Roger was one of the funniest and he was real. There was, you know, he didn't, it wasn't contrived with Roger. He just, now he competed when he went out there, but he, to me, you know, Jay Johnstone was a prankster. Tug was funny. Yeah. Uh, you, you get down the list and a lot of them are bullpen guys. Because they have too much time in their hands. Yeah. Larry, you can throw Larry on that list. Well, there you go. I mean, yeah. Steve Bedrosian. I, I, right. I could just go up and down a list of bullpen guys. But Roger McDowell, to me, was one of the funniest prank. He was a real prankster who enjoyed getting getting guys. And nobody ever better do anything to him or they were they were really going to be toast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good to know. Don't, uh, don't mess with Roger McDowell. Um, you know what, uh, the 08, uh, team for you, I, I know the 80 team is, is the one that you hold in your heart. Uh, and Hey, look, first world championship in Philadelphia, uh, with guys that you were around, uh, your age, but your reaction in the 08, uh, world series, uh, is, is stuff of legends. It, it is people talk about it to this day. Um, and, and I will point out to the folks that are listening at home, what wheels did when Harry was making that final call was exactly what a color analyst is supposed to do in that moment. And that is not say anything. And that is so difficult to do because the excitement of the moment, you know, is, is, is there for you. You're feeling it too, but your reaction to that, uh, world series championship was just awesome. It was well, awesome. You know, having been around it, we lived, the, we lived their life. Uh, you know, we start together in February and we end up in September and hopefully go into October and keep going. So we're together all the time. You, you become a part of the whole thing and you're emotionally involved in it. Uh, in Philadelphia, you have to be very careful about not being too much of a homer because to this day, I never said we and us on the air. I just right. didn't. I it yeah. just didn't play. So that night, I remember there was one out in the ninth inning, a runner on second base, uh, and that, uh, there was a camera, uh, Chris, I think, well, I can't remember. And anyway, a Comcast guy was over in the corner. And I remember him coming in, but my first reaction was, you'll appreciate this, was, get, oh, no, get out of here, you know, because <laughs> you're superstitious. You, yeah. But anyway, I totally I forgot it was even over there. And uh, the one thing on my mind that night, Murph, was whatever you do, don't mess this up. Because in 1980, when Harry, when we won the World Series, we weren't on the air. There weren't a lot right. of broadcasts locally right. in those days. So Harry did a record. You know, people, what's a record? Well, 78 RPM or 33 or whatever it was. And he did a great job recreating it. Still wasn't the same. Right. So I said, he never had a, this chance. And if we win this thing somehow right now, just shut up. Just stay out of the way. Well, I did. And I, I didn't even realize I had done that thing until we were down and you were there you were down in the tent afterwards what yes. about a couple hours afterwards and all these monitors all over the place and they were showing that thing and i remember thinking oh no you know it's one of those jackasses on wip is going to be making fun of me the next day or something <laughs> so uh we went down broad street the, you know two days later yeah and all these kids these young guys and people were looking up at me and they were going exactly and yeah. i knew it was okay 
I, I knew I knew what I had done was more than okay, and I might be remembered for a full bo body spasm for 37 years on the air, but it, it's okay with me now. I, that was real. It was the way people told me later, hey, we were doing the same thing or some semblance of it. We were hiding behind the couch or peeking out from around the corner and all that sort of stuff, but it was real, and, uh, you know, they were going to take it back. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it now. Good. I'm glad you are because, first of all, you'll be remembered for a lot more than just that one moment, and that is the truth. But I think that moment was uh, a moment where Philadelphia got to see just how much you cared about this organization and how much of it, it was a part of your life, just like theirs, you know, and here you were, you were there for, you know, decades and decades and you were, ex you know, you were excited in the moment. And I think, I think everyone was able to really connect with you at that moment and, and say, you know what, he's just like us. That's exactly how I feel. Well, I was probably seven or eight years old in 1953, 52, 53, when I went to Connie Mac stadium for the first time. So uh, I wasn't a Johnny come lately as a Phillies fan. <laughs> you were not. It, it, meant, it meant a lot to me because I had so many friends around. And, and you know what it really meant a lot, Murph? And you'll, you know, because you, you know so much. It meant so much to me for all the people that work in the offices. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows who they are. All the people that work so hard behind the scenes. And all the people in your minor leagues that work so hard. And uh, it, to me, that meant a lot because people know us, we're visible on that, but there's so much that goes on to make all that possible. And I was really happy to know that they were going to get a world series. Ring. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. It's, it's what it's all about. Wheels. I, I, we miss you for sure. You know, that, um, the city misses you, but I know you're enjoying yourself down there in uh, Clearwater now, uh, sitting out there on that. Yeah, uh, I, get, I got that once in a while. We want you to come back. And I said, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well maybe we, hopefully we'll come see you uh this time or in march of next year february march of next year we'll get to come down yeah, and i want to come up and see you guys this summer too you know okay. i'll be back in july and uh come i hope to be able to come out to a game so i think you. we can get you a ticket you love you me. love talking with you you're a good man and uh Thanks. we've always had a great relationship and we'll continue to have that Murph. we sure will great to talk to you wills i could do it i could do it all afternoon but i appreciate <laughs> your time and uh and i hope to see you soon Thanks, buddy. Glove Stories by Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download in the App Store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. <laughs> All right, we welcome you back to Glove Stories with Murph. And time now to relive a game from that great season, 1980. And we do that uh, just about every other week. And we bring in Larry Boa to help us do that. And Larry, I'm going to tell you right now, we are going to stretch your memory uh, today because we're going to talk about a game that you didn't play in. The date was July 1st, 1980. Uh, you guys had just finished up in June where you played 500 baseball you're 14 and 14 right. you had some good wins in that month but not some you know not uh, some great losses in that month as well but uh you know you're just kind of hanging around near the top of the nl east but uh coming into july uh you get injured and you miss a couple games that was that was a rarity for you at that time in your career but uh what happened that you weren't in about five or six games right now yeah, I'll tell you what, Murph, I, I hated missing games because you checked my bubblegum card. I played a lot. I yeah. had a lot of at-bats and games played. I got hit by a pitch on my uh, – I was hitting. It was my left hand, and it was my thumb. And the first x-ray said it wasn't anything, and they took another one. And there was a real small, like, hairline, but it, they didn't think I'd have to sit out that much. I think I missed four or five games, and I hated that, especially playing Montreal up there. Yeah. Uh, Ramon Avilas, if I'm not mistaken, filled in for me and he did yeah. a very good job. But every time we played Montreal in 80 and the Pirates, it seemed like, you know, we were, all three of us were jockeying for position. Those were big games at the time. And I did everything in my power to try to get out there. I just couldn't get my finger in my glove. <laughs> and so eventually the swelling went down. I played with it. And I know it was a small fracture because Don Seeger, who was our trainer, said, you can't hurt it anymore as long as you can stand the discomfort. And after about four or five days, I went back out there. But I, I hated sitting on the bench. Uh, the manager and the coaches hated me on the bench because I was always <laughs> talking. And I wanted to go out there and, and, and play baseball. But 
it wasn't to be. But uh, we had a pretty good series here. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Lurch pitched that game uh, against the Expos. He did. And him and, and, and it was Scott Sanderson, I think. That's right. Yep. Randy Lurch versus Scott Sanderson, July 1st, 1980. You're one and a half games behind Montreal in the East at the moment. A half a game ahead of the Pirates in the East as well. And it is. It's Lurch and Sanderson and the uh, Montreal Expos with just a loaded team. So we'll pick it up in the bottom of the first. And a guy who was really just getting his career started, becoming the superstar that he was, gets things started. Andre Dawson homers in that game. He batted 308 with 17 home runs that season. And like I said, he was really just starting to come into his own. But we all know what kind of player he became. He was unbelievable, Murph. And not only did he did he hit with power and hit for average, he could play center field with anybody. Mm -hmm. He had a great arm. He could steal bases. You know, you take a look at that team, that was a tough team to play. And he was the centerpiece of that. And they had Warren Cromartie and Valentine and Gary Carter and Ron LaFleur. Yep. Check the stolen bases out on those guys. I think LaFleur led the league in stolen bases. And Scott, he had 90-something. Scott had 30-something. Dawson had, I think, 30-something. And right. if you take a look, they, uh, Carter and Andre Dawson both won gold gloves. And in that particular game, you know, we talk about, all oh, guys got to get out after 100 pitches now. Sanderson and Lurch, I think, both pitched into the 10th inning, which that's unheard of now. Yeah. But that tells you the durability of, like I said, Randy Lurch being a four or five starter in your rotation. And I think St Sanderson was their three or four starter. So you got guys to the back end of rotations going 10 innings pretty good rotations. Yeah, they, they were both really good in this game, but the Phils do get to Sanderson in the fifth. Uh, three straight singles by by Lurch, Rose, and Trio load up the bases. Then Schmidt singled to score Lurch, but Rose gunned down at the plate. That would be big if, uh, later on in the game. Then Gary Maddox singles to tie it up. 2-2 two, two Sanderson. So Sanderson out of this game early in this particular one, but uh, he gave up 12 hits in this game, but only two runs. Hard to win games when you're you're knocking the starter out with twelve hits, but only scoring two runs, right? Yeah, he kept he kept us at bay. Uh, you know, he, he that's that's what type of pitcher he was. He's going to give up hits, but he always with men on base, yeah. he bear down and get you out. He had a big curveball through. He could throw strikes, and and Lurch again got matched up with him and did a very good job. But anytime that we went up there, it was tough to win up there. Uh, you yeah. know, they had a real good team and they played better in Montreal as opposed to being on the road. But you take a look at that lineup top to bottom. It, it was a pretty good lineup. It sure was. All right. But your lineup was uh, pretty darn good, too. And the score stayed 2-2 until the eighth inning. And Keith Moreland gets up. And, you know, we've talked about guys on the show that uh, maybe we don't talk about enough. Back in 1980, he hits a solo home run. Keith Moreland was big for this team. I mean, Bob Boone, obviously, is the, the, the guy that we remember behind the plate. But Keith Moreland was big. Keith Moreland, not, he, not only was he a good hitter, but he could play the outfield and catch. And if I recall, during the 80, he, uh, Dallas Green at one time rested Lezinski. And I know that Keith Moreland went out there to play left field. I know he picked up Booney behind the plate. But as you said, another unsung hero. I talked about Ron Reed in our bullpen mm -hmm. being an unsung hero. Keith Moreland. And you could throw Lonnie Smith in there in that month of September. We had a bunch of guys that came up through our system that really contributed. And when you have that kind of depth and you're going for a pennant, you know, guys get wore out, not only physically, but mentally, every game means something. And this was, this was a series where we knew we had to go in there and play good baseball because Montreal gave us their best every time we went up there. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right. So Montreal though, they come right back at it in the bottom of the eighth. Andre Dawson singles, a double by Gary Carter, sack fly by Warren Cromartie, and it ties it up at three. So we go to the top of the 11th inning. All right. And, and, you know, as you said, both guys had pitched really well. Moreland singles to lead off the inning, then two quick outs, then Boone singles, runners on first and second. Rose base hit, scores the lead runner. Then there's a play at third, and there's an error at, at third. I'm, I'm assuming that the throw sailed, there was an error, and uh, Boone scores and made it 5 3, and that would be a big run at that point. Yeah, it had to be an error for Booney to score on the overthrow. <laughs> <laughs> Booney's one of those guys that when he got on the bases, he thought he was Ron LaFleur. He, he, he <laughs> thinks he could go first and third and everything. But that ball, if, if, I, if I remember right, it was a throw from the outfield that went into our dugout there. So it wasn't a matter of him picking himself up and scampering home. It was an right. automatic, you get home, and that was a big run at that time. 
Yeah, yeah, it was because uh, the next half inning, Cromartie let off the bottom of the uh, inning with a home run. But then after that, they were shut down and you guys hold on to win it again. And, you know, we mentioned Lurch starts this game back into the rotation. But one of the things about this team that that uh, as I'm looking back and watching this season unfold again is that uh, you won a lot of games uh, when with guys like Lurch, the back end of your rotation, you know, getting the start. That's the sign of a really good team and a sign of a championship team. We did, Murph. And, and you know, the, the ironic thing about that, usually, I mean, I, I'm not just talking about the way baseball is now, but even in, in early 2000, and when you're four or five starter, you basically, as a manager, as a coach, as a player, you said, give us five innings. Yep. The back end of our rotation, they did more than five innings because we didn't have that eight guys down there in the bullpen. So you have to take your hat off to those guys. They battled. They took you well into the game. And I think that was very important going down the stretch when you see our pitchers still strong, our bullpen was still strong. So that has a lot to do with our four and five starters taking us deeper than most four or five starters. Yeah, and things started to uh, improve uh, in the month of July. You were just a half a game out of first ba- uh, first place at that point. And by, by July 3rd, you had tied uh, atop the division and uh, you'd be back and forth, you know, never too far out of it from there on out. And again, we know how it all finishes. Before I let you go, just an aside, uh, Moreland filling in for Lazinski. Lazinski getting a ball. He, he probably handled that very well, right? He was totally oh. fine with it. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's no question. But no, trust me, Bull wanted to play. Yeah. And in fact, him and Dallas used to go at it a little bit. And Dallas was one, you know what? What have you done for me lately? I yeah. mean, we love Dallas. But if you went 0 for 10, 0 for 12, he was not afraid to pull the plug and say, hey, you need a blow. We're going to put him. Uh, Moreland in, or he, I've, I've seen him take Gary Maddox out, put Lonnie Smith in center field. So he was not afraid to, to mix and match. And even though guys were mad, yep. basically when they took the field, they said, okay, when they got, did get back in the lineup, they said, we'll show you Dallas. Exactly. We could still play. But it was like a motivating factor for us because he wasn't afraid to pull somebody out and sit them down and rest them. Yeah, and it didn't matter what, what level of superstar you were. He was going to do it if he felt like it was the right move. Without without a doubt. He didn't care who you were, what you've done in the past. We need to win today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, he probably got tired of Lazinski on the bench next to him, too. So, God, he had you and, and, and Lazinski on the bench. <laughs> yeah, you, don't want, <laughs> you don't want both of us on the bench together. No, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> Larry, uh, always good to talk to you. Thanks for le- reliving this game. July 1st, 1980. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, Murph. Take care. Glove Stories by Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download in the App Store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. And welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph, presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. And uh, now time for us to check in on the 2021 team. And we'll do that with my good friend and the television voice of the Philadelphia Phillies, Tom McCarthy. Hi, Tom. Good to see you, man. Murph, good to see you. I'm outside the uh, Wells Fargo Center, the yes. um, the virtual home of Phillies road games on TV. It- exactly right. And you know what? Yeah. No one would know it because uh, you guys are doing such a great job. But uh, soon... Soon you'll yeah. be back out on the road, we hope. We got tailgating going on over here, right over here. I don't know if anybody can see it, but we got tailgating. They're tailgating for your show that's about to get, yeah. get started. I love it. Je- Jeff Halleckman, <laughs> Nick Marquetta, Josh Trager. The whole Trager. team is there. The whole team is Cruc- there. That's, Cruckers that's... there, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let you get back to the barbecue in just a minute. But let me All ask right. you about this team because, um, you know, we're seeing some good things. We're seeing some bad things. It, it's a similar feel over the last couple of years. You're playing about 500 ball right now. But I think one of the bright spots we've seen over the last two weeks or so has been Chase Anderson. He continues to, to get deeper and deeper into games, and it looks like he's starting to figure things out. Would you agree? Yeah, I do think that, Murph. I think his arm strength is getting bigger uh, and better. I, I still think he needs to go more than five innings, and I think he feels that same way, too. Uh, his last outing against Washington, it looked like he was going to go five innings. Uh, he was going to go at least six innings, but uh, gave up the home run to Trey Turner. And I, I think that I think his manager and his pitching coach are still a little sheepish on pushing him through the lineup a third time. Right. You know, to me, it's it's part of what's wrong with baseball when you don't push a starter through a lineup a third time. But it is what it is. But I think he's giving his team a chance to win. He's had one really bad inning 
and that was against the Rockies. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. So uh, if that's what you get from your number five starter, that's what you get. Exactly right. And giving giving your team a chance to win. That's what it's all about. All right. This bullpen uh, started off really good, had some uh, some dips. They've had good moments and bad moments of late, but uh, they're, they're missing an arm in Archie Bradley. I'm wondering your thoughts. We think he's going to be back uh, maybe by the by the end of the week, by the weekend. Uh, can he make a big difference? Will he, will that bullpen start to resemble what we saw in the first couple of weeks? I, I think he could definitely make a big difference. So he's, he's doing a rehab start on Wednesday night uh, with Lehigh Valley. They're on the road. And then he's probably going to do another one Friday or Saturday, uh, unless for some reason they feel like they can get him that extra work uh, up in the big league level. So I yeah. anticipate uh, that he'll, he'll rejoin the team. If it's not Saturday, Sunday, then it's going to be that first game on the homestand, but I think he could be a huge asset. You know, I know he doesn't throw as hard as he used to throw, but I still think that he could give a bridge to the back end of the bullpen. And, you know, people wonder, is Hector Neris the right guy for the closer? I think he is. Um, I think Archie probably has the command to maybe take that role. If anybody does, I don't think Alvarado has the command to do it, but I, I think Archie's going to help out a big help out a lot. Yeah, if nothing else, we'll help settle it down out there a little bit more. All right, uh, this is an observation of mine, and I'm wondering if you would agree with this, but it seems to me this season, offensively, this team, the Phillies, and it's not happening around baseball, but this team is doing a much better job of beating the shift, kind of spraying the ball uh, and, and using all fields, but certainly better than they have in, in the last couple of years. Well, I think there's some truth to that. I think part of it is that Didi Gregorius and also Bryce Harper are not afraid to lay down a bunt to the left side. And I think that's a big deal. Uh, I know you want Bryce to hit home runs. There's no doubt about that. You want Didi to drive in runs. You know, he's seventh in the National League in driving in runs. But I think the fact that they're able to pop the ball the other way on a bunt here or there. And I also think we saw uh, even on, on, on Tuesday night uh, with Alec Bohm, on Monday night with Alec Bohm, uh, no, Tuesday night with Alec Bohm going the other way, uh, where was the, the second baseman? It was shocking that he wasn't over there. JT yeah. Romito, it's shocking that they shift the way they do. So I think that plays to the Philly strength when it comes yeah. to those guys. Yeah, I think it's been really good to see. Uh, I'd like to see some more of it. All right, finally, uh, we got some interesting news this week. Certainly, it sounds like good news. Perhaps full capacity at Citizens Bank Park in the month of June, right? It, it sounds that way. You know, I, I think it's going to be gradual, Murph. I don't think it's going to be right away. Um, and, and I think by the by the time you hit the Yankee series, you're going to see um, a, a much larger crowd than what we have seen. I, I think that it'll be sort of a ramp up up until that Yankee series. Uh, but I think that we are, you know, we're days, weeks away from having full capacity. You, you know, there, there were some issues in Atlanta as far as concession stands go. Sure. Uh, but I think that that goes with the start of a season. And, and in essence, if you have full capacity, you are basically hitting the start button, the restart button all over again. Uh, yeah. So it's exciting to have that, that thought process uh, that, that, that we're going to see 30,000 fans consistently at Citizens Bank Park, if not more. Yeah, can't wait. T-Mac, thanks for being with us. Uh, continued uh, great work on television. And uh, tell the boys behind you I said hi. All right, I will. <laughs> Tom McCarthy, the television voice of the Philadelphia Phillies. Love Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app and is a production of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of our major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, Make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2021 Major League Baseball season.